I'm going to try to be quick because Dale has some really cool photos and videos in his room. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work in the space of digital justice and civic innovation, specifically about one case study that some of you have heard me speak before. We'll have already heard about um, the Red Hook Wi-Fi project. Uh, so this is a collaboration that we've had with the Red Hook Initiative, and um, New America Foundation is a think tank, and so a lot of what we're exploring and what my team, the field team, does at OTI is think about how to work with communities to explore al alternative ideas that can lead to policy formation later. So the main issue that we're looking at right now is the idea that everyone should have access to free and open communications infrastructure. And so what you'll see, what you'll see up there is um, examples of using some of the Form 477 data from the FCC. You might not know that the FCC has open data, but they do. Uh, it's not necessarily um, awesome to try and make decisions off of, but what they, <laughs> what these maps are looking at is by census tract, how many household subscribers you have to broadband um, in this like urban Detroit and Philadelphia, uh, and then the maps on the other side are some that we did as part of a series in Atlantic cities um, that you may have seen if you follow issues around cities with access. Um, and one of our ideas is that communities can build infrastructure to enable access and local communications on their own. And we do that, one of the ways that we look at doing that is thinking about how you can model digital networks um, on social, um, social networks that exist in the community. And the technology we use to do that is actually um, mesh networking software that we develop in-house. Um, it's open source, available online for anybody to use. Our goal is to make it uh, as easy to use as possible so that any community can do this um, in whatever the context needs to be. So um, one of the nice things about Mesh, uh, there's lots of negatives to it, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. Uh, but one of the things that makes it really powerful is that since Mesh um, is an ad hoc platform, an ad hoc protocol, uh, you can remove and add nodes in a network um, really, really easily, and the network will adjust. So where this comes in handy is when you need to rapidly spin up uh, new nodes in a network, uh, say in a disaster response situation, or um, even in just like a normal community situation, maybe, for example, I was sending emails today about why I couldn't log into the network because one of the node hosts, one of the router hosts is actually a church, and the church is turning the power off at night, and you know they don't always get in. The pastor at the church doesn't get in until noon or so because he's more focused on the afternoon set of times, right? So he can turn on and off the power um, and participate when he wants to or when it, when it works out for the church's hours, uh, which lets it model a lot more how our social interactions work, how our neighborhoods and communities function. So Mesh is really great for matching those purposes, um, although there are other critiques about it from a performance perspective. So the case study that I'm going to talk about is Red Hook Wi-Fi. Um, Red Hook as if you're not familiar with it, is a neighborhood in Brooklyn in New York City. Uh, it's separated from the rest of Brooklyn by a um, above-ground highway that's actually an elevated highway, so you, to get to the neighborhood you have to walk under the highway. It's um, a little bit, makes you feel a little bit scary sometimes. There's lots of speeding cars, people on and off ramps from the highway. Um, and one of the main features of the neighborhood is actually one of the largest public housing uh, complexes in Brooklyn. There's about 11,000 residents. Of the 15,000 total that live in the neighborhood, 11,000 live in the public housing. Uh, so it's also historically been an industrial neighborhood. So this is an aerial shot from one of the buildings um, close to the water looking in. And you can uh, see lower Manhattan, obviously. But off to the right, you can see a sort of tall red brick building. Um, that's actually the public housing, which is clustered in the center of the neighborhood. So um, one of the goals. Uh, and what some of the like takeaways from this project in general is this idea of leveraging community anchors in, in the neighborhood um, and having uh, thinking about community-led design processes as a way to address multiple issues. So one of the ideas behind starting this network was to think about ways to bridge the communities in the neighborhood, so the public housing community and then the more commercial gentrifying district that's a couple blocks away. They call it actually the front and the back, and the two don't interact that much. So one of the ideas was how could we build social cohesion uh, through a like local communications project. Um, another idea was also in doing that, thinking about how the community as a whole could be more resilient to um, disasters, would have you know better like local networks. Think about maybe even 
to connecting people to jobs that were starting to come with the new businesses in the neighborhood. So the technology that we use, like I mentioned, is um, Commotion Wireless software. Uh, it's open source, uh, free and open source, and we um, the primary development leads are actually us <laughs> in the think tank. So again, a weird activity for a think tank, but trying to think about other ways that um, technology is developed. Uh, we use Ubiquity hardware. Um, a lot of people use Meraki hardware if they're thinking about things like this. We can talk about hardware later if you want. Uh, we use Ubiquity because it's really easy to put our software on it, and they don't get mad at us for doing that. Um, they're actually very interested in the projects that we're working on, so we have an open dialogue with them about it. Um, so it started uh, as just a router on a rooftop sort of pointed at the housing based at the Red Hook Initiative. Uh, this one was providing a, an internet gateway to the community um, and just sort of like seeing if people would notice it was there. Uh, there was another router that was sitting on top of an apartment building overlooking one of the main public parks in the neighborhood. Um, this one didn't have an internet gateway but did have a local web page so when you got to it there would be sort of like a way that you could leave chat messages, it's sort of like a Facebook wall, but just a HTML page, and people could leave messages for each other. Most of them were like, where's the internet? Hey, what's up, dude? Like, things like that, people talking to each other. But stuff that actually wasn't happening in the neighborhood on the street, um, but was instead happening on this uh, local server. So the two were actually too far apart. There was a school in the way, a couple blocks of distance, lots of trees, things that make wireless signals get interrupted. Um, and as part of the ex uh, this experiment, the, you know, Okay, routers are up in the neighborhood, but what do we want them to do? Um, the two leads on the project, Jonathan Baldwin, who's a colleague of mine, and uh, Tony Schloss, who's the director of community initiative for the Red Hook Initiative, started hosting um, participatory design workshops uh, at the Red Hook Initiative with residents, thinking about what services were needed, what were the problems in the neighborhood that you might want to address, uh, what should the goals of a project like this be? Um, and through that, they actually started developing uh, this platform that we call Tide Pools, which is basically um, tiles that were created custom for the neighborhood uh, using you know, Leaflet JS and some custom icons that um, the community designed themselves and created really like a digital ownership of place for the neighborhood. And with it, they started. They brought in open data feeds, so they started offering. So on the Wi-Fi network now, there's this local application running where you can find out when the next bus is coming, because there's only one bus line through the. There's two bus lines through the neighborhood. One that actually runs on some amount of consistency, and has actually an API for um, when the bus is coming, which is a project that's been slowly rolling out in New York City, but was tested in Red Hook Park, which is kind of amazing. So um, now when residents log onto the network, they can go and find out when the next bus is coming. They know if they'll be waiting for 20 minutes and have time to maybe go back to their apartment and, or wait until they go out to the stop, things like that. Just basic information services that weren't there already. Um, and then Hurricane Sandy hit. So the thing that was really interesting about this was the community workshops and the local apps and the placement of Wi-Fi actually meant that a lot of people ha knew that they could come to the Red Hook Initiative for Wi-Fi. So they were Everybody like ran there to be able to get online. There was no power, um, no communication services for about three weeks after the hurricane in the neighborhood. It took a long time for them to get around to bringing the heat back on in the housing. Um, and there was a couple of snowstorms, which was fun. Uh, so the, everybody sort of flocked to the Red Hook Initiative for a variety of services, but also a lot to get online. We saw a huge amount of people jumping onto the network in the days after, and so it was clear that there's a need for alternative infrastructure in the neighborhood and that people knew to sort of cluster around the Red Hook Initiative for that access. So we very quickly spun up again on tide pools, just building in a way for people to text in problems. So if they did have cell access and if their phones had power, they could say like, oh, we need a generator here. Let's get people responding to this. Um, and we had this running at the Red Hook Initiative. So people who were monitoring for things coming in could reply and it would actually send a text message back, but they could reply using the map-based pop-ups. Um, we quickly deployed like four more routers running off of battery power so that we could cover more of the park uh, where FEMA was also setting up recovery, um, a recovery tent and sort of a processing of getting people filling out forms. Um, they brought us a satellite uplink so that we had uh, internet access and actually a local ISP plugged in their fiber uh, which they had, they were able to keep their services up during the um, storm and afterwards. 
So what started as just like two routers, one near the park and one um, in that sort of cluster closer to the highway, uh, very quickly became coverage in the whole area. Um, like literally in an afternoon, we were able to put up more routers and expand coverage and services to uh, the places where people were primarily gathering for response um, and getting new resources. So um, that's just the network visualization. So fast forward <laughs> a couple months, um, the government saw that the mayor's office saw that this was a really valuable initiative and that we should play with growing that out some more um, and gave the Red Hook Initiative funding to start running a job training program uh, focused on building out the network, but also on just developing technology skills within the community. So these are the Red Hook Digital Stewards. Um, they're all 19 to 24 years old and live in the Red Hook housing. Uh, they, so there were six the first year, and uh, this year there's actually 12. They're continuing the program. And they started thinking about what it would mean to have a network covering the whole neighborhood. So this is some planning exercises. So they're just, they have routers, and they're thinking about power structures and who are good community assets and anchors and what the neighborhood actually looks like to them. This is more conceptual mapping activity. Um, they actually went out and again using Tide Pools, the platform that we had in place in the neighborhood, they were texting, oh, this building is tall enough to house, host a router. Uh, these people are really important members of the community. We want to make sure we provide access there. Everyone hangs out here. Let's make sure there's access there. So doing inventorying and site surveys. Um, they started thinking about how to do outreach. Uh, so this is the flyer. It says, call me. I'll help you set up your router. Um, and you can get internet access in the community. Uh, and they started thinking about more community anchors and partners. So again, as part of that inventory process, they identified uh, good organizations that could host routers that will be really important partners um, that might want to leverage the network as a way to advertise services in the neighborhood. Um, and started, so these, these are young adults who have never worked with a lot of this, these types of tools. They sort of think of the internet as what they get on their phone because they don't even necessarily have computers at home but they were starting to learn about how to do a lot of this um, mapping and analysis and network planning um, all through this program. Uh, and that's, this is the same Form 77 data in Red Hook. So this is the problem that we're trying to think about. All the red that you see is the public housing, so that's where there's the lowest adoption rates. Um, and it sort of donuts out from there where there's uh, more of the community lives in the yellow and green zones, and some of those are newer buildings that have you know, been set up and wired to start with. Uh, so this is some of the stewards installing a router on a roof um, and carefully leaning out to install a router on the other side of a metal fence so that the signal can go further. Um, thinking about how they actually want to set up uh, a network switch and making sure that the routers can get access. Um, that's Kathy making an internet cable, <laughs> ethernet cable. A router hanging out with some plants on a roof. <laughs> Um, and so quickly from the seven nodes that we got to after the hurricane, they now have um, about 25 nodes. Uh, and this is sort of the coverage area now, which is actually covering one of the main, um, uh, what's the word, urban farms that's in the neighborhood, as well as some of the park spaces and most of the commercial corridors. And there's, there's a couple little clusters. And they're continuing to build out this year. And actually one of the best stories that I've heard so far from Tony, who's now teaching the program on his own and running it within the community um, without as much support from us, uh, is the new group of digital stewards, they were doing that planning exercise, and they actually identified three new areas in the community where the network doesn't exist already, where they were thinking about it being needed without them even knowing necessarily where all the access points were. Um, and uh, we've sort of updated tide pools to be more mobile friendly. Um, so there's and a lot of what's happening right now in Red Hook is continued long-term recovery from the hurricane. Uh, the, the, the stewards are now not only acting as network builders and community organizers, but they're um, gathering people together to think about resilience in the community, think about engaging with the government and getting the things that are needed for the community to actually come together and continue to come back because there's still places that haven't been fixed actually from the hurricane, businesses that are still having trouble and things of that nature. So um, this year they've got 12 young adults and they're continuing with that. They've set up an advisory board and they're really, they're engaging with communities along the lines of disaster recovery, economic development, diversity in technology, um, digital justice, civic engagement, public safety. Um, it kind of <laughs> goes, every week we get a new request of someone interested for a slightly different reason because some part of the story applies in some interesting way to them. Um, so the main big takeaways, 
Uh, the social relationships in the neighborhood are really important and really useful for leveraging in technology projects. Um, and doing, basing this off of the community's needs, so thinking about go, going needs first and addressing, how, thinking about how this can, wireless can be a platform for community change and um, community building. Uh, a big thing in a disaster, having the stuff already there is really useful. So part of what made it easy to build out the network was we had a pile of routers sitting around waiting to be flashed and installed so that we could expand the network. We just hadn't been running with it yet, but we were ready to go, which made it very easy to respond quickly. Um, these community projects can provide, can be the organizing vehicle to bridge multiple groups in the community. And as, even though it's challenging, one of the things that we've learned in the last year is the more that we can share the practices that we're learning as we go, the, the broader community can grow. And now there's like four or five different networks in Brooklyn that are all trying to get started. And they're talking with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office and really trying to institutionalize a lot of this in a very interesting way. Um, we're seeing New York City's Economic Development Corporation put out interesting RFPs where they're thinking differently about how infrastructure actually gets built. Um, and a lot of it is lessons learned from seeing projects like this grow and be uh, developed from the community. Um, so up next is more thinking about alternative power, uh, building in more texting so that we're not just having like mobile friendly smartphone pages um, and other applications to the neighborhood. They're thinking about games to engage people in playing with the, with the network so that they're comfortable using it in the case of another disaster. And things like that. Um, and that's it. Thanks.